Our presentation today features Pennsylvania's SR30 over Bessemer Avenue Bridge replacement that was completed in a 57-hour closure over a weekend this past May. We are pleased to welcome our presenters, Lou Ruzzi, PennDOT District 11 Bridge Engineer with the Pittsburgh area, John Myler, PennDOT District 11 Assistant Construction Engineer, and Bala Sivakumar, Vice President and Director of Special Bridge Projects with HNTB. Lou? Okay, thanks, Mary Lou. And uh, again, my name is Lou Ruzzi, District 11 Bridge Engineer for the Pittsburgh area. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, which was done in 57 hours, the State Rob Bridge 30 over Bessemer Avenue. I'll, I'll kick off the presentation today and then turn it over to Bala Siva Kumar to talk about the design and then John Myler, who will talk about the construction aspects of the project. Oh, man. Not moving. Oh, we'll try to hide your taskbar on the left there. Just right click. Okay. There it goes. Thank you. That goes. All right, here we go. Uh, the talking points today, I'm going uh, to be giving us quick facts about the project and some of the project goals. Again, uh, design highlights by Bala and then the construction highlights and lesson learned by John. Uh, here's a picture of the existing T-beam bridge on SR30 over Bessemer Avenue. It's about 30, uh, about 11 miles east of the city of Pittsburgh, and you can see some of the issues with this urban bridge. Very deteriorated structure. Uh, what you can't see is a deteriorated concrete deck that actually has a hole in it. We have about a six-foot plate covering this hole. Uh, uh, numerous times this bridge was hit due to the uh, low underclearance of 13.9, uh, concrete falling down onto the traffic below. Uh, you can see the utilities uh, under and near the bridge. And then on the far side uh, to the left, uh, there's a house uh, where my arrow is pointing. And it's about four feet between the wing wall and that house. There's a little sidewalk that goes through there. So that was also a concern. Uh, Given the fact of the condition of the bridge and uh, the detour, which was 17 miles for the main detour, uh, we, we couldn't do half-width construction on this project. It was, uh, in fact, when they went and demolished the bridge, it came down very easily. So we were concerned about that. And then with the 17-mile detour, it really wasn't a good local weekday detour. And so we, we felt this was a perfect spot to use ABC construction. Uh, again, here's uh, the first map above shows Pittsburgh and uh, in the North Braddock area, uh, East Pittsburgh. That's where this SR30 River Bessemer Avenue is located. And here's an aerial view of that uh, project area, Bessemer Avenue going underneath Route 30. We had, uh, the project was led on November 11th of 2015, or November 5th of 2015, with three bidders. Uh, Brayman Construction was a successful bidder at 2.33 million. Uh, second bid came in at 3.13 million, with the third bill, uh, bidder at 3.209. Uh, we had a pre-bid meeting, which was attended by four contractors. Uh, they had a lot of good questions there. As we said earlier, HNT was the de design. HNTB was the designer and helped her, uh, with that uh, pre-bid, answering a lot of questions. Uh, we ended up building a structure that precast abutment caps, steel beam modules, with concrete deck already and barrier cast on the, the module. Used ultra high performance concrete joints in between the modules. And then we came back about a month later to put latex over the deck. We also use precast approach slabs. Uh, if I didn't say so earlier, we uh, had an ADT of over 21,000 on this road, Route 30 with four trucks, 4% 4 trucks. Uh, again, here's the detour. It's a 17-mile detour. That's the big detour you see here. Uh, but then we also had a smaller detour that uh, I believe was about three miles. And yes, and. Uh, some of the local traffic that lived and worked in this area took, took these, this detour. But if you had to take the detour from the bridge all the way around, that was 17 miles. 
Uh, some of the goals, again, we, we wanted to replace this bridge over superstructure, uh, the superstructure over a weekend. Uh, we uh, felt since we had done a previous replacement project about two years before that we could accomplish this. Again, uses, utilize as many precast, prefab elements as possible. Uh, we wanted to pick an overlay that was going to last a long time, and that's why we went with latex. Uh, we have tried some of the other uh, overlays, uh, like epoxies, and uh, some of them uh, we're just not uh, convinced they, they work for a long time at this point. Uh, so we went with latex. Again, we wanted to minimize impact to the adjacent property owner, apply as many lessons learned as we, we could from our previous project in Wampum, PA, that we built in seven days. Uh, we considered it innovative bidding, but we did not use innovative bidding on this project. And we wanted to improve the underclearance, and we were able to do that from 13.9 to 17.2. Uh, we used protein meetings in Pennsylvania and some of our districts. Uh, what that means is we get together with the designers and uh, PennDOT, uh, GTEC unit, anybody that's involved in the project. And we try to narrow down the number of alternatives as much as possible. Uh, you know, if we know what type of bridge we want to build, let's get to the point and have the designer do that, and not spend a lot of time studying alternatives and wasting engineering money. Uh, we also had subsequent constructability meetings to further limit the number of alternatives. Uh, we also want to design this bridge as quickly as possible. We saw the condition of that bridge out there, and the falling debris. We were getting calls regularly about that, and uh, as well as the hole in the deck. Uh, again, I believe this is where I turn this over to Bala, and he'll, he'll talk to you more about the existing bridge and the design features of the project. Okay, thanks, Lou. Uh, the existing bridge is a concrete T-beam bridge built in 1930. Uh, it was a relatively short span, but it had a curved alignment. Uh, so we had uh, super elevation issues to uh, deal with. Uh, the concrete abutment was uh, on spread footings. We also had to increase the underclearance from 13.9, and eventually it was over 17 feet. Uh, the main project uh, elements uh, for the design was the superstructure replacement and the uh, substructure rehab. Uh, specifically, we had to uh, <coughs> uh, replace portions of the abutment seat that were heavily deteriorated. Uh, also, we had to raise the seat because the uh, bottom of uh, superstructure was now uh, coming up. And also, there was uh, uh, concrete repairs to be made, which could be done either before or after uh, the Super Weekend. Uh, in terms of ABC design, there were a number of challenges. Uh, since we were keeping portion of the existing bridge, we wanted to be very sure of the as-built information. The plans were not. Uh, you know, that uh, 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 good in terms of verified actual information, so we had to uh, do a LIDAR survey for that. Uh, we also thought through the ABC method. Uh, <clears throat> with the aggressive schedule, a heavy move would have been a lot faster, but the site constraints were such that uh, we had to go with uh, prefabricated elements uh, to be able to uh, <coughs> uh, make this uh, replacement happen. Uh, it's a very uh, built-up urban area with uh, very, very limited space, uh, which was one of the reasons uh, uh, we had to work with, uh, with uh, prefab elements that uh, we could accommodate within the available space. Uh, there were also high voltage overhead lines, uh, which also limited the size of cranes we could use. So we had to keep the uh, weight of the uh, pieces down as much as possible. Uh, there was curvature and super elevation issues to uh, deal with. Uh, also, we had to find a way to quickly remove and replace the tops of the abutments and portions of the wing walls, all within that single weekend. 
and also replace the approach slabs and also think about the ABC connections uh, that would allow us to meet this uh, uh, aggressive schedule. So the entire design was uh, schedule driven and every uh, decision was based on uh, whether we could actually uh, achieve that within uh, the available time. So we started with the LIDAR survey and uh, came up with a fairly accurate, detailed uh, 3D model of the existing bridge. Uh, what's highlighted in red are the elements to be removed, the superstructure and portions of the uh, abutment wall uh, <clears throat> below the seat areas. Uh, there was quite a bit of deterioration in those areas and that also allowed us to come up with a new cap uh, which would raise the seat elevation so that uh, we could improve the under clearance. So let's start with the schedule and then we'll look at the design elements. Uh, before the weekend closure, we gave the contractor the option uh, to do some pre-cutting of the abutment walls. The walls were more than three foot thick uh, and many times this would need a cut both along the front face and the back face. Uh, we also allowed some saw cutting of the approach pavement and uh, the concrete repairs could be done also before the ABC weekend. Now during the uh, uh, weekend closure, uh, these are the key items of work. Uh, one is the demolition of the superstructure and the approach slabs and the backfill excavation. Then they would saw cut and remove the abutment uh, <clears throat> uh, along the, the cut line. Uh, then they would connect uh, precast caps with dowels. Uh, then they would erect the uh, superstructure modules. Uh, these are steel beam with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, pre-decked uh, elements. And uh, then they would erect the sleeper slabs uh, and the approach slabs uh, at each approach and then place the uh, uh, closure pores and we needed a rapid cure closure pore. We wanted to use UHPC so we went with the accelerated cure UHPC that uh, would allow us to open uh, the bridge to traffic within 12 hours and uh, <clears throat> we had to get all of this done for reopening the bridge on Monday 6 a.m. for inbound traffic into Pittsburgh. Now, uh, the post ABC weekend, uh, the approach slabs were designed to temporarily support live load so we could come back and fill behind the abutments with global fill at a later date. Uh, then they would also place a rapid set uh, latex modified overlay. This was done about a month later uh, <clears throat> at about an inch and a quarter depth and uh, saw cut. And the final step would be uh, <clears throat> apply a protective uh, coating on the abutments uh, after all the repairs are completed. Now, from an engineer or a designer standpoint, this is roughly how we had looked at the critical path and the hours that we estimated. Uh, for the removal, superstructure and substructure, roughly about 14 hours for that. Uh, the next thing on the critical path would be installing the caps, the superstructure modules, and the approach slabs, and we <coughs> estimated roughly about 20 hours for that. And then uh, the last uh, <coughs> item of work would be the closure pose and curing of the closure pose, about 17 hours. So we had about 51 hours, and the time allowed was uh, 57. Obviously, uh, there were some weather elements that uh, they had to deal with uh, during that weekend. Okay, now for the design, uh, we went with a steel composite uh, modular superstructure system to keep the pick weights down. Uh, you know, the size of cranes and uh, the pick radius, all of that fi uh, figured into the uh, decision. Uh, this was shop painted. Uh, the beams were straight and the curvature was handled by varying the overhang. 
Uh, the UHPC, we went with the rapid set or accelerated kill uh, UHPC, the JS1212, which gives you 12 KSI in 12 hours. Normally, the uh, UHPC takes up to three days to gain adequate strength to support traffic. Uh, and then we had three cast abutment caps. Uh, they were brought in two sections to minimize uh, the pick weight. And then uh, the final element was the precast approach slabs. And uh, they were supported on flowable fill at a later point. And then they became ground supported slabs. Uh, this is a cross section. We have six modules. And uh, one of the decisions we had to make was how to handle the super elevation on this bridge. It was about 4%. So uh, we wanted to do something that would make the assembly and the field erection uh, go quite smoothly. So what we did was to keep the uh, two steel beams at the same elevation. This way we could provide a level bridge seat that would be stepped from one module to the other to follow the, uh, the super elevation. And then secondly, within the module, to make up for the slope of the deck, we had the haunches that were varied. So one beam had a, <clears throat> a smaller haunch, and the second beam had a deeper haunch. Uh, so uh, with those two uh, design uh, choices, we were able to meet the super elevation. The uh, concrete, the use was lightweight concrete. Uh, this helped keep the, uh, the pick weights down. Uh, and we also did an extensive study of crane placements and uh, uh, the erection process and made sure that uh, what we were showing, both in terms of size and weight, could be erected. We wanted to keep the elements generally within a 50 ton maximum limit. Only one of the exterior modules uh, was about 60. Everything else was less than 50 tons. Also keep the shipping weight, uh, shipping width within about 8 foot 6 to allow uh, easy transport over the road. Uh, all of these elements were checked for, uh, for the erection. Uh, keep the maximum concrete stress uh, within modulus of rupture with a safety factor of 1.5. And this did not control the design. We did indicate uh, the elements uh, for lift, or the uh, points for lifting on each of the elements. Also, the uh, weights of the elements were also given on the plans. Uh, to make sure that we had good fit up, uh, because again, this is a rehab, uh, we had a 3D model of the existing bridge. And we did a full 3D model of all of the new elements. And we did a virtual fit up using AutoCAD Revit. And uh, this virtual assembly helped us uh, make uh, several adjustments during design to make sure that all of these pieces fit properly. And we shared all of the 3D renderings with the contractor so that during fabrication and erection, they knew how uh, these elements were all supposed to go together. We also did a construction simulation using Navisworks with 4D. And we actually shared this during one of our pre-bid meetings so that the contractor could see on an hourly basis how construction would progress from start to finish. This is the uh, superstructure plan. Uh, you see the curved alignment. And the modules are essentially straight. And this is a view of the removal of the top of the abutment walls. Uh, the the uh, depth of removal was anywhere from uh, a foot and a half to about three and a half feet. And the new cap that we placed was anywhere from three to six feet. So the bottom of the beams were coming up by several feet. And you see at the bottom right hand the second cut being made after the backfill was excavated. And they were able to get a pretty smooth cut uh, for the most part. And that made uh, the assembly uh, go uh, quite well. Uh, this is uh, from one of our, uh, the rendering from one of our 3D models. Uh, you see the two precast uh, caps. Uh, they were brought in two sections. And you see the way they are stepped. 
and we also provided a corrugated uh, void a pipe with a void in, in, in the middle to allow dowels to be inserted for connection to the existing abutment. And this is an elevation view showing the, uh, the voids in the cap. Uh, and we had number seven dowels uh, that were then installed. The precast cap was seated on steel shims and we gave about a one inch gap that was then grouted with rapid set grout. So the contractor was able to use the steel shims to hit the correct elevation we needed for the bridge seats. And we also provided enough steel shims so that the erection could progress while the grout was uh, curing. And we had separate ports in the cap uh, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the grout. Uh, this is a cross-section view that shows the, uh, the, uh, the superstructure modules. The end diaphragm or the back wall was uh, integral with the deck. It was cast with the deck. It had a seat for the approach slab. Uh, this would then sit on the precast cap, and the precast cap was uh, supported steel shims and grout at the bottom. And at the back, we had two layers of uh, waterproofing membrane, uh, so it was uh, pr uh, well protected at the back. Uh, also, the steel beams themselves were supported on elastomeric bearings. There were separate uh, uh, openings left for the uh, elastomeric bearings under the, uh, under the steel beam. So here you see the uh, cap being placed on the steel shims ready for the grout. And as you can see, they got a pretty good cut, fairly level, and this part worked pretty well. Uh, this is a cross-section view of the module, and on the top left you see the haunch detail I was talking about. One of them had a deeper haunch, and the uh, second beam had a shallower haunch. The deeper haunch was internally reinforced, and this made, and the beams are set level on a level bridge seat. At the bottom right corner you see the UHPC closure pour. Uh, it was an 8-inch closure pour with a 6-inch overlap. Uh, using rapid set or uh, accelerated cure UHPC. Uh, this was by far the heaviest module. This weighed about uh, 130,000 pounds uh, or thereabouts, uh, a little over 60 tons. And it's about 8 foot 6 inches wide. And, uh, <clears throat> and the decision was made that we were going to precast the sidewalk, the parapets and the barriers all with the uh, uh, modules. Uh, again, this was done to save time. Uh, another uh, <coughs> a rendering from our 3D model, here you see the assembly in progress. Uh, the modules uh, being assembled uh, on the precast cap. Uh, in the bottom right corner, you see the, uh, <coughs> the uh, beams uh, all in place, or the modules all in place and the uh, form work for the closure pour uh, already in place and this is uh, the uh, step before they actually uh, uh, install or pour the UHPC uh, from above. Uh, on the approach slab, we followed a similar uh, uh, type of uh, design with uh, precast elements, uh, brought out the uh, uh, the slab or the approach slabs in, in seven foot, uh, roughly seven foot wide uh, uh, precast elements and connected them with the same kind of a UHPC connection. And later on, uh, first uh, traffic was uh, allowed to ride on the approach slab, uh, which was supported on one end on the sleeper slab and the other on the concrete end diaphragm. And then we came and uh, filled uh, below the approach slabs with uh, flowable fill. Uh, this was done again as a way to save time and get the bridge open to traffic quickly. So here's the detail at the uh, sleeper slab. Uh, it's about a five foot wide slab that supports the other end of the approach slab. And then we had a transition piece that uh, 
made the connection between the new approach slab and the existing roadway. And the final step here, these are some repair areas we had identified on each abutment, uh, mostly concrete spalls and some uh, crack repairs that uh, had to be uh, injected. Uh, with that, I'll turn this over to John to talk about some of the construction highlights. Thank you, Bala. As mentioned, I'm going to discuss um, some of the construction and lessons learned uh, through the construction phases of the SR30 rapid bridge replacement. Uh, first thing I want to mention is uh, the, the weather conditions that we were expecting for this weekend was supposed to be a uh, chance of rain Friday night into Saturday morning and then mild temperatures and, and um, clear weather for the remainder of the weekend. Uh, it didn't quite turn out that way and you'll see some of that in my presentation. Uh, first off, again, looking at the existing structure, you'll notice the lower utilities were relocated prior to construction. But the overhead lines uh, did remain in place, and as Bala had mentioned, uh, they were de-energized uh, for the weekend during construction. Uh, crews got the road closed uh, relatively quickly at 9 p.m., which was the allowable time. But it did take them some time to mobilize to the structure. Uh, as mentioned, there's really no laydown room in this um, construction site. So all that had to take place after the uh, road was closed. Here's a photo shortly after 11 p.m., about 11.15, uh, they had started demolition and they took down half the structure within about 15 minutes. Again, just kind of showing you the quality of, of uh, the, the poor condition of the existing structure in place. Here's another photo showing that, that um, section coming down. The last photo shows both sides of the structure now demolished. Uh, you can see this is about 11.45 p.m., so within about 45 minutes they had the um, majority of the demolition completed. However, it did take them um, uh, into the morning hours to complete the full demolition and removal of all the debris. Uh, and, and shortly after uh, demo started, the rain did begin, uh, which was fine during construction actually, or demolition. It actually also helped keep the dust down um, during those time frames. So in those overnight hours, uh, they did prep the abutments. Uh, for the precast abutment caps to be set. Uh, here you can see on the abutment one side, the first piece going in. If you look closely on top of the abutment, you'll see the steel shim packs. Uh, as Paul had mentioned, they did a great job making that saw cut, but there are some differences still in the front to back saw cuts. Uh, this was one of our lessons learned that we wanted to note the difficulty in leveling uh, these abutment caps. Uh, again, this is critical stage. Uh, everything from here up is going to be built on that, so if you don't get it right uh, from that first stage, um, you're going to have troubles throughout the remainder of the, the weekend. Here the second piece is being flown in and set. Uh, again, you can see crews on the abutment two side setting those shim packs um, for that setting, uh, which will happen uh, in the near future as well. Here the crews are doing the final tie downs and uh, forming up for the grout work uh, underneath. Again, the total time frame here, you can see this was at 3 p.m. They did have the pieces in place, but uh, by the time they got everything anchored down, grouted, and ready to go, um, it took, a, it took a roughly another uh, eight to nine hours before they were ready to begin uh, setting deck. Um, also a note here on the bottom of the screen, if you notice the subsoil conditions behind the back wall, again, because of the uh, excessive rains we got, uh, you can see the conditions there, and that, that did lead into a little bit of extra work. Uh, we had to do some over-excavation to, to correct that prior to setting uh, the sleeper slab. Moving on to about midnight, so this was Sunday morning, uh, we were able to start setting the deck panels. Here, this is the first deck panel uh, that would be set, and this would continue uh, into mid-morning Sunday uh, for the remainder of the panels. Uh, this piece was the heaviest. Uh, it maxed out at about um, 65 ton. Uh, with the rigging, totaled 79 ton. So here they had a 500 ton crane that you can see the arm of there. It was set in between the two abutments uh, for setting this piece. 
Uh, it would also be required for the other fascia as it also had a uh, barrier. Uh, they also had two other cranes on site, 190 ton and a 265 ton. Those were then used for um, setting the other deck panels and the approach slabs. Here's a photo of the other uh, deck fascia panel being flown into place. Uh, once all the panels were in place, uh, crews could then begin forming the joints for the UHPC placements. Um, again, roughly 7 a.m., they had all the panels set. They could begin that forming operation um, for the UHPC. Finally, at about 4 p.m., we were ready to begin placing the UHPC. Um, one of the uh, again, less here is the fluidity of this mix, uh, and you'll see in a uh, another photo here next. Um, it acts very similar to almost a water, so your forms need to be watertight uh, in order to retain this material. There is no aggregate, um, so we had some issues with material flowing through the joints and having to, to tighten those up uh, during the placement. Another issue we had was getting the longitudinal bars in that joint. Uh, you'll see the straight bar dowels coming out of these slabs. Um, we then had to feed a longitudinal bar through that joint. Um, again, this is one of the things that we thought we had kind of solved with our constructability discussions was in place of hoop bars, putting these straight bars should make it easier, but we still had difficulties with that, so always something to think about um, for future placements. Uh, the UHPC placement did take roughly six hours for a total of 20 cubic yards. Um, and, and again, so that puts us at a time frame of wrapping that up about 11 p.m. This was shortly behind schedule. Um, so we placed the joints in a manner that would allow us to open the westbound uh, inbound lane to Pittsburgh. So for the morning commute, if we were uh, running tight, uh, we would maybe be able to open those inbound lanes um, on time for the for the morning commute. So due to the cross-section of the bridge, if you notice on ball of slides there, it's about a 4% cross slope. You couldn't fill the joints up without having a low side um, on one side of the joint. So they would fill the joints up and then put a form down on top. Uh, once they had that to complete uh, the filling operation of that joint, they placed buckets with holes in them tied to the forms uh, about every 12 feet, and you were able to go um, bucket to bucket, and by loading that bucket and creating a head pressure, you could see that force the material up into the next bucket and so on and so forth, move across the joints. So with all that um, taking place and wrapping up, uh, at about 11 p.m., they could begin the curing operations. Uh, we did put heated blankets down on top of the joints. Again, as part of the accelerated UHPC, you needed to uh, maintain a, a higher temperature. We tried to maintain about 120 degrees in the material, so we heated below and from above to try and get those um, strength gains in about 12 hours. Here you can see the structure at the time of opening. This is shortly after we reopened. Um, so uh, we did hit the 57-hour mark for the inbound traffic. Uh, we uh, achieved the strength of 12 KSI. Uh, at 6 a.m. for those joints, and we did open up the inbound westbound traffic at 6 a.m. However, the uh, outbound lanes, which were eastbound, uh, did not achieve the 12 KSI until 8 a.m. So uh, unfortunately, we did um, uh, hit the contractor for some liquidated damages because the contract required unrestricted traffic by 6 a.m., um, but still they did an outstanding job of completing a project like this. Uh, with the weather conditions that, that we faced. Uh, again, as Bala had discussed, you can see that the approach slabs are spanning, that void is there, and we've come back and fill that uh, during the week under uh, limited lane restrictions. Here, we started filling that uh, flowable fill in the approach slab area. You can see they had six inch diameter holes in the approach slabs to facilitate that material being placed underneath and then they simply formed and, and placed this in one foot list to not overload um, the back wall. The second weekend closure was to perform the latex overlay and the asphalt uh, paving transition to the new, the new structure. Uh, here's a photo 
the contract only required us to uh, do a shot blast preparation for the LMC overlay. Um, but what we found is there were some elevation, uh, minor elevation deviations between the joints and, and to alleviate having to do a lot of grinding, uh, we worked out with the contractor just to do a profile mill uh, across the entire deck to, again, just kind of improve that, that uh, uh, uniform layer of LMC. Uh, it only called for an inch and a quarter, which is our minimum required, so we were concerned that if there were any deviations in that, we could potentially have uh, issues with the LMC in the future. So this, this was a perfect preparation for that LMC. The next morning around 6 a.m., uh, they were able to begin placing that latex. So here you can see the crews placing the latex and brooming in the latex uh, just ahead of the actual material placement. Uh, this continued to about 7.30 a.m., and then we let that sit uh, 12 hours. It was an accelerated mix. We let that sit for 12 hours to gain strength. And then the overnight hours of Saturday into Sunday, the paving crew came, uh, performed their paving operations in and out of the structure, and um, also had transverse grooves then cut into the latex uh, Sunday morning. And we were able to open back up uh, at roughly noon on Sunday. Here's a photo from below of the final uh, structure in place. Uh, again, you can see in the, the future weeks we performed uh, the substructure repair, sidewalk replacement, and also the paving underneath the structure, uh, and then an epoxy coating on the uh, abutments themselves. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, play a uh, video here, time-lapse video showing the structure replacement over the two weekends. And during this, I'll, I'll point out a, a few key operations and uh, also talk about some more lessons learned. Uh, one of the things I want to have you focus on is the manpower. I think this does a great job of showing the number of employees that the contractor hit, had on, on site throughout the entire weekend. Um, this was one of their concerns that uh, the short duration required such a, a large number of employees that impacted other projects they had in the area. They had to uh, steal some employees from that uh, to make sure that they could get this job completed uh, in the time frame given. Uh, they also expressed concerns with the amount of lead time provided at the beginning of the job to get the materials uh, for the project, uh, getting the steel beams. They had a roll schedule they had to wait for, and then obviously acquiring all the necessary materials uh, to precast uh, prior to um, placing them in the field. So they did request uh, that maybe we could provide in the future more lead time for them to get that material. Again, as the video plays here, you'll notice some of the rain events hitting the camera uh, and the difficulty you can imagine that that creates. Again, uh, the benefit of having all these precast members is it doesn't really preclude us from working in the rain. However, if any of you have worked in the rain, it can be slightly miserable for many of the employees. And so obviously that makes it a challenge for uh, just the guys working out in the field and experiencing all that. Here you can see the 500-ton crane showing up at this point, uh, setting that up. That was also the, the largest pick there uh, adjacent to it, which will be the first one to go into place. So here, again, uh, they're finalizing all the abutment work and getting prepped to, to lift that beam here shortly. Again, one of the difficulties here, because of that weight, the contractors uh, you know, expressed concerns with these picks. If we could reduce those weights, it would benefit us you know, reducing crane sizes and the amount of cranes. As you notice, he moved that crane, move it, and set it back up for the uh, next placement uh, while the other cranes are lifting and setting those, uh, those precast panels and, and abutment, uh, or I'm sorry, approach slide pieces. So again, once all this is in place, uh, they could start forming underneath for the UHPC. You'll see we dropped some tarps here over the side. Uh, that'll allow us to help kind of maintain some of the, the heat in the overnight hours. Uh, while we're placing it. Uh, we did dodge some bullets here with, again, the rain events. Um, we got lucky Sunday afternoon. There was rain kind of all around us, but it didn't hit the, the project site. So they were able to get the UHPC in, um, in with the weather conditions we had. Shortly after having everything in place and buttoned up with the curing, uh, the rain did return, and you'll see that here in the, uh, in the future hours. 
here's the number, uh, again, of workers placing that UHPC. You'll see they're working from the close side to the far side of the structure, um, placing the UHPC. Again, because of those operations um, and the deviations and uh, some of our past uh, experiences with the UHPC um, and some, kind of the, the deck grades and elevations, um, both the contractor and, and, and the department felt that the, the latex is a preferred or recommended method. Uh, it's going to give you a much better ride. It's going to seal uh, all those joints, uh, protect the surface. Um, you know, for a little more longevity from, from the structure. Again, here's the rains coming back into the morning hours. The fog also rolled in. You'll see crews placing the guide rail into the structure on both sides. Uh, inbound's now open. They're completing the outbound side, uh, prepping that for opening uh, here directly. So that going into the second weekend now, uh, you'll see crews are going to perform the milling operations across the deck. Um, prepping that for the latex placement, the pressure washing and, and covering of plastic to maintain the, the uh, moisture in the deck prior to uh, the LMC placement. Uh, crews also got to set the bid well. Uh, they had uh, brackets on the parapet and then uh, a, a rail setting on the sidewalk uh, to place the bid well. Air crews are placing the latex, pulling the curing back across it. Uh, through the remainder of the day, they did come back and saw cut the joints at the approach slab, the deck interface. Uh, those got sealed, so they sawed and sealed those um, during the day. And as we lead into the evening hours here, you'll see the uh, paving crew uh, show up to perform their milling and paving operations. They also performed the milling and paving underneath the structure uh, on this weekend as well. Uh, it just served as a good time to um, knock out both, both sections of work um, while the pavers were on site. We did extend the paving limits a little bit to uh, improve the ride, uh, given the new elevation of the structure uh, to just kind of prevent a bump situation. We extended um, the asphalt transition to about 20 feet on both sides of the structure. While this is running, I want to mention one of uh, our other um, lessons learned. Uh, all these items were dry fit at the prefabrication plant, and both uh, the contractor and department, while it was difficult, felt it was a, uh, a key importance to preassemble those pieces at the, um, at the fabricator. We did find a couple discrepancies with uh, connections from the approach slab to uh, bridge panel barrier interface that they were able to correct uh, in the shop prior to delivery to site. So we thought that was a, uh, a benefit, uh, having that fit up done um, prior to setting it all in the field. Here you'll see the transverse grooves being placed on the deck now. And um, once that was complete, uh, we were able to open the structure back up to traffic. Uh, the last lesson learned I want to discuss here was the 3D renderings that uh, Bala showed. Uh, again, those were very helpful and useful, seeing how the structure fit together piece by piece. Um, both, again, the contractor and department found that to be very useful and re would re recommend that for uh, future placements as well. That being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Lou. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you all for Thank you all for a good presentation. Uh, I guess at this point, we will uh, turn it to Ben Bierman, who will moderate the question and answer period. OK, great. Had a ride. Uh, Lou, John, Bala, great job on the presentation. Great job on the project. It all looked really great. Um, so folks, we received about 30 uh, pre-webinar questions, and of course, um, about 20 or so questions uh, as the webinar was going on, and uh, we're continuing to get your uh, questions as well. So I've got them grouped in um, some categories here. We've got those in the uh, decision making and planning. Uh, the other category is design, engineering details, material selection. The other category is UHPC, category on tolerances. The other one, of course, construction. 
and the last one cost. So we're kind of going to go in that order and we'll start off with the uh, decision making planning type questions. So um, we've got all the all lines opened up here so uh, we can start off with um, for this one probably directed to you Paul, uh, Lou. Was there any risk management included in the construction phase to ensure that the ABC work would be completed as planned? Well, I, I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer that, but I, I mean, we tried to uh, use as many lessons learned from the previous project that we did in seven days. We tried to match those details uh, as much as possible, uh, although for uh, this project, Bala uh, and his team came up with uh, even more standardized and easy to construct details to, to reduce that risk. Uh, Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, the using the 3D approach uh, was one way of uh, mitigating uh, uh, risk associated with fit up. Using a lidar survey of uh, of the existing structure uh, because we were concerned about uh, fit more than anything else. Uh, doing the dry fit up uh, also was able to catch any fabrication related issues. Uh, so those were the key ones we were looking at. We spent a lot of uh, time thinking through the connection details, uh, whether they would be able to achieve that within the time we had allowed both the connection between the cap and the uh, abutment and the connection between the modules, all of that. Uh, yeah, those are the key uh, risk management things we looked at during the design and fabrication uh, uh, pieces. And during construction, maybe John, you want to talk about any issues that uh, you all looked at for managing risk in that time frame? Yeah, again, obviously, as we've mentioned, weather weather was a concern, but uh, we thought we had good weather, and, and even with the bad weather, we were still able to, to get the project completed uh, uh, on time, I'll say. Um, uh, we also had that restriction of that overhead power line, um, as it was a, a large KV line, uh, we needed to get that completed before the summer months. Uh, the utility did not want to shut that down um, uh, during the summer months because of the extra draw with air conditioners. So that kind of forced our hand uh, as well to to kind of get this job completed. Uh, you know, certainly sooner than later. And I would I would add too that uh, on our past project we had problems with leveling the approach slabs. Uh, that took almost a full half day longer to do than we expected. And, and on this, we kind of took that out of the picture by uh, putting the approach slabs, letting that go, and that backfilling operation go to the, a month later. And that, that took that risk away as well. Great. So um, you mentioned um, liquidated damages. Were, were there also incentive uh, penalties included in the project, like IDs, incentives, disincentives? Uh, no, there was not. That, that, that was discussed uh, during the design phases, but um, uh, cost-wise, we couldn't really. We didn't want to justify the the additional costs in in uh, providing any monies for being completed earlier. But we did have to hold the LDs uh, because of the ADT. But, but I end up. What was it, John? Five thousand an hour, and they, we, they went over by two hours on the on the outbound? That's correct. They were hit for uh, $9,200. Uh, $9,200 were the LDs. Great. Great. And so before we get out of the decision-making planning type questions, uh, and this one might go out to you, Bob, is um, there's definitely all kinds of ABC strategies out there. And it looks like you used prefabricated element um, for the most part on this project. Um, any considerations to other strategies like the lateral slides or the SBMT, the use of the SBMT? Uh, yeah, we did look at uh, you know the other move types, SBMT or slide in. Again, uh, the site was. Uh, I don't think the pictures capture this uh, in a quite 
adequately. There were so many restrictions on uh, on on available space, uh, and the right of way was almost non-existent. Uh, it was almost fascia to fascia, with the uh, houses right abutting the uh, structure. So. Uh, it was decided that uh, we should move as much of the construction off site, uh, prefabricate them, and and only bring them on site during that weekend. So uh, the the ABC needs space, especially if they're doing a heavy move, and that was not available at this site. So uh, it wasn't that difficult a decision to decide to go with PBES. Uh, and the biggest challenge we had there was the erection, the size of cranes we can get in there, where we can place them, how we can erect the pieces without interfering with the uh, power lines. So those are the bigger challenges uh, once we decided it was PBS. We did everything to keep the weights down and, 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 and the pieces manageable too. Okay. Great. And so we'll go into the design, the engineering, um, details, material select, and it kind of folds into this uh, uh, next question is, is, you know, you use the steel beam modules, um, and you talked about um, trying to get the module weights down, and you were dealing with this vertical clearance. So were there other considerations to be using perhaps like a, a box beam or a, a dead bolt T next beam, or I guess a concrete strategy over a steel beam strategy? Uh, yes, I, I, I think uh, the decision was uh, very clear to us that uh, a lightweight steel modular system would be the way to go. Uh, next beams could have been an option, uh, but uh, they would have weighed uh, quite a bit more than uh, what these modules weighed, so uh, I think the the cost uh, of uh, transport and erection would have uh, been quite a bit higher and uh, for this particular site. So uh, yeah, it was essentially a decision driven by the pick weights to go with uh, with steel. And you were dealing with quite a vertical clearance uh, improvement. It looks like you went from a 13.9 to a 17 foot 2 inch, and and you had a 4% uh, cross slope on the existing. And I don't know what the road was like underneath, but you guys really got some area up underneath that bridge. Yeah, I believe the old bridge was uh, was hit. I'm not sure what kind of uh, traffic uh, quite uses that. Maybe Louis can talk to that. Yeah, we were trying to get as much under clearance as possible. Yeah, I mean at 13.9, we our experience is we get we get a lot of hits at 14.3 and, and below. Uh, there there is an industrial area down below uh, the structure down the valley and uh, you know they're they're probably getting a lot of truck deliveries down that way. It, so it was most of that vertical clearance from um, the beam selection itself. Uh, or is there a combination of raising that grade uh, with the use of the new abutments and the detail yeah, at the end? Yeah, it's a combination of uh, structure depth and and also looking at the uh, the roadway profile. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's it, it's both together. We were able to uh, you know uh, go quite a bit higher than than thirteen nine. Yeah, and I would add, uh, typically on any superstructure replacement, we always have to make sure that we're as close to the existing superstructure weight as possible, so that we don't get into having to uh, analyze the substructure. And you know, as long as we're within 10 percent, uh, you, you know, then we can. Uh, you're you're uh, you're okay with reusing the existing substructure. And so there were a couple questions related to your bearings and your thermal uh, movements. So, in general, what type of bearings did you use, and how was the thermal movement accommodated for the structure? Yeah, we had uh, uh, steel laminated elastomeric bearings. Uh, 
Uh, I didn't have a detail there, but uh, again, it's a relatively short span, and uh, the uh, the back wall was uh, sitting on a neoprene sponge, so it was able to uh, move. So that's uh, room to move at the abutments, and we also had the beams on the elastomeric pads, which were able to deform and accommodate the thermal movement. So. Uh, you know, there was no open joint or anything uh, at 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 the end, but uh, we were able to uh, allow that uh, movement through the, uh, the combination of the elastomeric bearings and the uh, and and the neoprene sponge uh, that separated the back wall from from the apartment. Okay, great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the UHPC that was used to close the uh, modular uh, units together. So um, the contractor's uh, perspective with using the UHPC, were there any issues, were there any concerns, was it difficult for them to, to place the UHPC? Um, what kind of feedback did you receive, uh, John? Yeah, we did have some concern uh, going into the project. The contractor had never uh, used the product before, so they had some concerns. Uh, Lafarge did supply the material, um, and what we actually did is we did a test placement. We had Lafarge on site both uh, at, in the field for the actual placement, but also for a test placement. And the contractor set up a mock setup uh, in the yard um, for that, that setup. We, we, we did everything as we would have in the field. We heated below and above uh, all those steps. Um, and, and I think that really took out the question marks of, of what was going to happen with this material. It made uh, their employees much more comfortable with what they were going to experience with it, how the material flowed. Uh, again, we weren't sure how fluid it was going to be. And it's, as I mentioned, it's very fluid. So again, I would stress that, that uh, having a test placement um, really, really settled down the nerves of it. And, and, and when the UHPC gained straight and cured up, um, were the issues removing the uh, the plywood and the formwork underneath? And what was it like to go ahead and profile it back down um, prior to setting the OMC overlay? Yeah. So, so again, um, that test placement was was ideal for this. Um, they tested taking off the plywood, uh, you know, within uh, five hours, and then certainly waiting the full 12 hours. And, and the material gets very hard; uh, it's very dense. You do not want to uh, be dealing with it uh, in, in that post-set phase. So what they found is that uh, stripping stripping that material at roughly, uh, you know, the eight-hour time, um, they could still get the material off, um, the plywood off. And um, have uh, you know the remainder of the strength gain um, after that. Again, as I mentioned, the material was uh, with the cross slopes slightly uneven, unlevel. Um, we kind of had some experience with that. With the, as Lou mentioned, the project we did uh, two years ago uh, that just had an epoxy overlay. So you have kind of that little bit of discrepancy there, and trying to grind that um, could be. Could be difficult, so we found that with the milling operation, there was no um, issue to uh, correct any of those surface deviations. Great. So, John, since we're going to kind of fold into the construction category, if we can hop on over to slide 17, which I believe shows the engineer's uh, estimated time. There's a question for you: Is um, how well did uh, the actual construction activities line up with the uh, engineers' uh, estimates there? Yeah, again, um, really well. Um, you know, it was difficult there with some of the weather con considerations in it, but um, I think what we probably maybe missed a little on the uh, demolition side is that was probably more in the 12-hour range, and a lot of that may be accountable to uh, having to move into the site. But again, they really couldn't. Uh, move in prior to shutting down the road. So they spent a lot of time uh, with, with that piece of it. Um, looking at the uh, precast abutment caps, again, we were right in that mark, maybe a little bit uh, over the eight hours there. The superstructure modules, we hit that probably about eight hours. Uh, the approach slabs were kind of incorporated in that si same time frame. Um, maybe what was missed was uh, 
forming in all those joints. Uh, that took us the better part of you know, Sunday morning and early afternoon. Uh, the UHPC placement was spot on. We were at six hours there. And of course, the, the curing time, again, we were right on with the 12 hours uh, with, the, with the temperatures we held that material at. So we, we were pretty much right on here, uh, adding, in, adding in a few hours there for those things that I mentioned, and, and that's how you got the 57 hours. Right. Okay, so we're out of time right now. I'm just going to ask one more question for you, John. Is um, there, there were a lot of questions related to this. Uh, was, what was done because uh, with the noise mitigation? Because a lot of the activity um, occurred, construction activity occurred at night. And were there any issues with the folks that were adjacent to the pro uh, to the project? Public relations. Um, again, being that close, there was nothing we could really do. And given the time frame, we had to work the hours that we worked. Um, in advance of the, 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 the project, we met with all those property owners and expressed to them what we were going to be impacting them with. And, and actually, they kind of made fun of it and sat out in their porches and watched us late at night. <laughs> watched to work in the rain. <laughs> That's right. Uh, OK, so folks, we're out of time for the questions. And there's, there's another 2030 that we have not even gone through. And I know what we'll do is go ahead and get responses posted to the remaining questions. Uh, we're certainly out of time here, and we want to thank those, uh, both John and Lou and uh, Bob for presenting. So we'll, we'll hand this on over to Adderod, if you can close this out, please. All right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. And uh, thank you, Lou, Bala, and John, for such a great presentation. Uh, on that note, we will conclude this uh, webinar, and we hope to have you with us uh, next month, September 15. Uh, which is uh, going to be devoted to latest ABC innovation in railway bridges in U.S. We haven't had too many webinars on these topics, but uh, this is a very promising, very good presentation, and hope that we have you with us again next month. Until then, so long, and have a great day.